So I'm going to just stick with the inspirational stuff, because I'm going to expect you guys all to go online and look up Sodex's work, right? So a little bit of the inspiration. Uh, you know, what, what got you into studying uh, structural engineering? I love math. I just love math. It's like my mother's a mathematician, and I just love math. It's like, you know, I, I, I love buildings, too. I love architecture. But I, I went online, and I looked at all the catalogs to study architecture, and I immediately thought, really, just not enough. <laughs> this is her. But I love architecture, but not enough math, right? And so after two degrees in engineering, a bachelor and a master's in uh, Italy, um, Cassino? Yeah. Outside of Rome? Yeah. Cassino, outside of Rome, two degrees. Uh, she was awarded a grant to come and study in the U.S. And, and um, they were sending her to Columbia University in New York. And she said, oh, oh, wonderful, can I go and, and can I study architecture at Columbia? And they said, no, this is an engineering grant. You have to study engineering. So all of this time, she's been working on studying architecture. In the meantime, she has another master's in engineering. Uh, she teaches at Pratt uh, and at Columbia. Uh, she is the partner and director of structural engineering in the New York office. So she keeps getting closer and closer to architecture, <laughs> right? Um, one day someone will probably give her an honorary degree or something, right? Maybe I or you or whoever could do that. Um, but so after working in, I'm trying to think of the name of the firm you worked at before. Conicethe. Uh, for years. My, Seven, eight, nine years. Okay. Nine years. Um, somehow she had taken on all the engineering she felt she needed and she was looking for the next challenge. And so this is how she got to Sobek's office. And I tell this long story because you're all students, right? And this is a, a, a group of, well, not all students, we have some teachers, but they used to be students. And they inspire their students to go out and practice. Um, <coughs> would not hurt a few of you, if you think about it, to maybe do a master's in structural engineering, right? The combination is quite beautiful. Um, but mostly because I just think it's inspiring. But once you kind of find what you love and, and what you intend to spend your time grooving on, um, you turn around one day and you're one of the youngest female partners in one of the most important firms in the world and you kind of did that, you did that, by doing nothing but following your passion. And so with that little introduction, we are very pleased to welcome you. as um, half an architect, half an engineer, in the sense that 
We want to build what the intent of the architect is in a way that is efficient, that is sustainable, that is um, particularly well performing while also uh, being beautiful. Because most of the work that I've been doing, especially in the past three years, has been on exposed structures. And so it's as much part of the architecture as any other piece of cladding or anything else that you can think of, like a facade. Um, for the nine years prior to that, when I was working at Thornton Tomasetti, I worked on amazing projects all over the world, lots of them built here in the US, um, one over all of them, the Berkeley Center Arena in Brooklyn. Um, it's a great project, it took five years to design it and build it, uh, but most of the structure that I designed is concealed. You will never see it. So size-wise, detailing-wise, it was a lot more practical a task than it was ever an architectural type of task. So it served the purpose, it greatly served the purpose, but it never really had an aesthetic function. Uh, it was all clad, it was all concealed, it was there, but nobody would never know that it was there. And so when I joined, it was really about doing something more, especially when it came to efficiency, to innovation, to different ways of designing and building. I was looking for more of that. And some companies don't quite offer as much um, a chance to do that as others. And Werner's of it was, to me, one of the greatest examples of how you work your architecture into the engineering. So there it was in 2016, and I became a partner, and um, you know, the company itself has over 300 people all over the world. Uh, it started 25, almost 26 years ago in Stuttgart. Uh, Werner Sobek himself started one-man show, just him. He's an architect and an engineer, so uh, there you go. That's the whole philosophy. That's how it already started. It originated as an approach that was um, kind of like a merging of the two worlds, and it kept true to that throughout time. So since the very beginning, um, the, the approach was engineering serves architecture and works with it, not against it. Um, so the company grew. Uh, it has now nine, almost ten offices actually, um, throughout the world. And they offer different types of services. It really is a very wide range of services. So throughout the offices, we basically cover all of the aspects, uh, facade engineering, structural engineering, any sort of specialty structure and specialty materials, as well as sustainability, energy, MEP. Uh, so anything you can think of, architecture obviously, anything is covered within the company. Um, briefly on facade engineering, it's one of the aspects that the company is most known for. So lots of glazed um, type structures, lots of cable facades, lots of uh, beautifully exposed pieces of glass that almost have no structure behind them. All of those things are what we're known for. And we work across the spectrum of a project development. We start at any point um, throughout design and help guide the project to the end. Um, it's true, sometimes we start at CA, so in construction administration, when everything is already designed and they don't know how to build it, they call us and they say, okay, we have this amazing facade concept on the joints, but we do not know how to fabricate it or install it or build it. What do we do? And then our company helps with actually giving a rational approach to the design. We've done it, for example, at the um, uh, National Museum of Qatar by Jean Nouvel, which is almost completed. And the entire facade was declared impossible to be fabricated and built. Because Jean Nouvel had this great idea of the beautiful discs that reminded him of the rose of the desert and everything, but the geometry was so crazy that they had no clue how to even shape the panels to install them, let alone not shape 75 million panels, all different in shape and size. And so our company came into play and found a way to automate the process and make actually that construction modular and repetitive. So not only are there not that many panels, but they're also highly repetitive. So cost, time of fabrication, and all of that gets cut down by a lot. And so this is kind of an example of how flexible we are with the approach to it. Sometimes we don't design something in the very beginning, but we help it make um, a reality. So we build everything that we design. Um, in terms of how many systems for facades we work with or have worked with, pretty much anything. We don't only work with glass, not only with structural glass, we work with all sorts of materials. 
And usually the approach is whatever is most efficient is what we're going to work with. So it's never a blind approach to we only know how to do something with steel or aluminum or wood. It's whatever works best and there's a reason why it works best. Um, again, materials are pretty much anything, any type of cladding material, um, structural material that you can think of. Um, structural design is the group that I lead in New York. Of course, there are other structural groups across the other offices. Um, I started our group in 2016 in the New York office, and we work in very close quarters with our facade and our sustainability group. So we're very happy to have most of our projects fully integrate the services. Because to us, it's important to have all of those parts of the projects work together and speak the same language so that there's no conflict, there's no overlap, there is no uh, compromise to be um, made by one or the other parties. So the architect gets their vision um, built uh, in reality and all of the engineers get their design and their um, performance out of the building. Sustainability, big, big part of who Werner Sobek is. Um, he's been doing sustainability research for the entire time, but especially for the past 20 years. So starting at the end of the 90s, towards the end of the 90s, he started research. Uh, last year I presented one of our uh, projects. He's built every year for 15 years a prototype house that was highly sustainable. And the technology has evolved throughout the 15 years, so we've always um, built state-of-the-art structures and monitored them 24-7 for extended periods of time to make sure we would understand their behavior, their response, their performance, and we would optimize our own systems to perform better the next time. And after 15 years, we've, uh, we can say we have really peaked and we've gotten exactly the result that we wanted, which was, um, it's highlighted a little there, the triple zero concept that we had started using in 1999 uh, is a concept that says structures should really respond to three criteria. They should be associated with zero emissions, zero waste, and um, zero energy, which means you should build structures that don't consume energy, but they produce it, and possibly they produce more than what they need, so you can actually store the excess energy to be used by the same building later on or by another building that might actually need it so they don't have to take it from the grid. And the idea of zero emissions is why would you build something that has, that contributes to greenhouse emissions and all that? Let's think of methods of construction that don't just respond to the basic criteria of this is how we do things, this is what we know how to do. Let's build with innovative materials, let's try to build recyclable um, buildings, let's try to put materials back into the cycle once we've used them. Instead of simply downcycling, let's start thinking at this uh, about an approach that is a little more active that way. And zero energy for that reason, zero waste, because if you recycle, there's nothing left at the end of a life cycle of a building. You put it back into the cycle, and so you're not hurting the environment um, at all. You're, you're building a zero impact on the environment. And we built such a building, we built many of them actually um, in the past two years, following that example, um, all the way down to a building that we finished last year that is actually, it's in, in Switzerland. It's 100% recyclable, but it's also made of 100% recyclable or recycled already materials. So nothing in that building will ever end their cycle there. It will either be put back into the cycle or it already comes from a cycle and it will be over and over again. So we studied ways of connecting components in a building that aren't the classic ways of gluing things and, and, and merging things and melting things together because you can never get the original materials back when you try to do that. And so you can never recycle those. At best you can downcycle, but that's not what we want. And so we've studied new connections and plug type connections to make sure you can pull pieces apart afterwards from a structure and use them over and over. So this is who we are, and it's a big part of any design that we do, whether it's for the facades or for the structures or for both. Um, so we work with all of that. We work with the architect, we work towards an optimization, but we go through all of those analysis and strategies that you see there, because it's important to understand what the building will experience throughout its life cycle. So first of all, the materials, where they come and how they perform, and then how they will perform once they're in the building. 
what the response of the building will be, what the comfort of the users demands for, and all of that. So we do all of those analysis. We come out with um, with last build ups and all of those things that respond to that criteria, so that you have optimal performance and minimum energy consumption. This is the workflow in any of our offices, including the New York one. So we work on the editing side, the structural design side, daylighting analysis, lots of computational design for complex geometry uh, projects, obviously, as well as Revit or AutoCAD or Rhino and all of the interfaces between them, which are necessary to cover the complexity of most of our projects. And all the way down to graphic design, whenever needed. So we cover the full spectrum to make sure that the building is um, designed in all of its aspects. These are just some of the projects that we've um, built or designed in the New York office. Uh, we've been around 15 years. This is actually our 15th birthday this year. Um, some of them are small scale, like this um, Museo del Acero. This is a museum in Monterrey, Mexico, that we built a few years ago. The scope is very special and very limited. You see this, um, this feature stair, for example, made out of folded metal plates. They're about three millimeters thick, and this stair is completely cantilevered. These cables that you see here are only for show. They're not actually supporting the stair. It cantilevers out from the other side. So you understand the, uh, the challenge of such a long cantilever, such a thin metal plate, just folded metal plates with no visible connections anywhere. Um, that was one of the, the scopes that we, um, we were asked to cover. Many other ones, um, residential with particular challenges such as very, very long cantilevers and fully exposed structure. You see here truss, three stories worth of trusses, fully exposed. The same building changed uh, at some point and changed and morphed into this, still a very significant cantilever. This is actually all fire rated glass, so we had to study a special two hour fire rated type glass that would be uh, available in certain sizes and with certain curvatures and things like that. So we had to do market research for the most innovative products because they were just not available at that time. Very large um, entertainment venues as well as museums, airports, this is the airport in Kuwait that is actually um, currently being finalized by our several of our offices. This is the building that I mentioned earlier in class that had the shape memory of Roy uh, facade. So this is a competition. It won actually a metals and construction competition two years ago. Um, office building where we did um, the structural, the facade, and the sustainability design of the building for, for the competition, just out of New York, and many other ones. But today I would like to focus on just one of them, which is this one that you see in the middle. I'm just showing a detail of one of the facades. It's the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. If some of you have been there, you probably have um, seen the existing campus. It's in the middle of Manhattan, really, uh, in the area, neighborhood that we call Chelsea. And uh, the institute is expanding, and it's uh, planning on building a whole new building that they call the New Academy. Building. This um, over here is the main facade, the north facade, the largest one of the entire building. Um, and it's one out of ten types of facades that make up our scope. So we only have a facade scope in this project, but you will see why I had to get into it since the very beginning as a structural engineer. So this is the existing building here. This is Lumen, looking this way. This is the big facade you just saw. And this is the new building for FIT that um, is now a, a bit fixed, so almost starting construction. These are the architects that are working on this building, uh, shop architects out of New York. Uh, they're famous for many uh, large buildings and achievement. Um, amongst them, one of the tallest buildings in New York City is coming up. It's on 57th Street, part of what we call Billionaire's Way now, because all of the crazy expensive buildings are coming up along that street. Uh, they worked, I worked with them uh, on the Barclays Center that I mentioned before. This is an 80 foot cantilever a piece of structure there, just to give you a frame of reference. Uh, it's in Brooklyn. Uh, they worked on, they're working on the Uber headquarters building, the Domino Sugar Factory in, in Brooklyn. They work um, a lot in New York, but also pretty much anywhere in the world, really. Um, they're a large office, um, and this is our team just for the FIT project. So we have two structural engineers, 
and then we have four um, facade engineers and designers. Um, the reason being, the project is extremely large. The design time was very long. Construction is about three years expected. And just the, the complexity of the scope demands lots of work and lots of detail. So let me just walk you quickly through it. Um, ten types of facades, as I mentioned, they're summarized here. I'll, I'll give you the details on some of them. But the main one, the, the most eye-catching one, and it will always be like that, is WTO1. So this curtain wall system here that I showed with the first rendering. And then there are many, many other ones, including, um, just because that way it's more fun, an existing facade. This is the facade of the existing building that we're restoring and putting back into place uh, so we can build um, the new one right um, in front of it. And we're building a little bridge that connects the two, which I'll show. So in section, just in terms of the program, it's a fashion institute, so they do lots of knitting, they study with fabrics, they build models, they have labs, all of that, classrooms. So this is what the building looks like. It has basement levels as well as several um, above ground levels. And this is a detail of the facade that you saw in the rendering. And behind here is the existing building called the Feldman Building. So this is the existing facade that I'm going to tell you about. Now, what they did is they shaped it in a way that we could get some natural daylight into the building. We leave some kind of an atrium that is full height throughout the new academic building here. Uh, but you also have some physical connections with the existing building. So you see here this interior quad, there is a bridge basically that connects the new and the existing building there across that large atrium. Uh, WQ1, this north facade, uh, has basically full-on glazing with a um, backup structure that is made out of steel, T elements, and they're all clad in wood. So I'll explain a little more. These are all the layers that make up the facade. So it starts off with the circulation, because if you notice, the patterns of the circulation are actually reflected, reflected in the patterns of the facade. So they wanted to somehow go by that type of pattern and make that the rhythm of their largest feature facade. And then you have a bunch of woven panels, as they call them. They wanted a decorative elements that reminded people of what the building is about. It's about texture, it's about materials, it's about fabric. And so they have these decorative panels with basically a woven motif running through them. And that sits on top of the main structure, which is made out of steel elements, basically, and uh, cladding uh, made out of wood. And uh, over the top of that, on the very, um, basically on the very outside of it, is the glazing. So full-on glazing there. Uh, this is what it will look like when it's built. So you see the wood cladding, and you see the woven panels here, all this white motif, is basically all the woven um, panels. This is what it actually looks like. We had to come up with a strategy to, to build this and make it the most efficient because all of the structure is fully exposed. And so they wanted to see the industrial look of it, but they didn't want it to be too heavy, too expensive, too clunky. And so to make it elegant, the first thing we thought was, why don't we hang it from the roof? So that the steel is actually mainly in tension, and steel in tension works to be the optimal size. It's the smallest size it can have. It works really well in tension, it buckles in compression, right? But you don't want to support it from the bottom because the sizes are going to have to get very large in order to avoid buckling. So we hang it from the top. Uh, if you go back and look at the actual structure of the building, it's already coming out of a cantilever truss. So that just adds to the complexity of it. But our structure is not a truss. It looks like a truss, but it just behaves like a hung feature, um, basically, off of that cantilever. And it has a front board, the green one, which is flat and it's where the glass sits. So it's completely flat all across. And then it has a back board, the pink one, which changes because it actually hosts circulation inside of it. So it gets wider and narrower according to whether it's hosting a stair, an escalator, and whatnot. And in some cases, it doesn't host anything and it gets extremely narrow there. So this whole pattern actually changes across about 36 of those elements. This is a section through one. There's 36 of them, and none of them is the same as another one. So you can imagine how complex it gets, and you have to build the full model to allow for the interaction between these steel elements to so make sure you catch any compression 
any buckling risk, all of that. And make sure you're optimizing your sections, but not making them any bigger than they have to be, right? So that's what we did. We came up with a size that is basically a T-shape. So both the front quarters and the back quarters, both of them are a T-section. They face each other, so you have the flanges here, and then the stems basically face each other, and your glasses on the outside. And then they clad everything in wood. So all that is exposed is really just the bolting. All these counterstock bolts that you see here are exposed. The cladding just stops short of them to show them. This is an architectural decision. And then everything else is a half inch cladding in wood that is applied onto the steel. So here you see the flange of the T, the flange of the other T. This is the inside, and this is the glazing on the outside. Um, what is the makeup of the glazing design? I thought I would give you a little sketch that we did earlier on with the built up, um, just to give you, you know, a little bit more of a detail. So this is your T profile from the outside, the front port that stays straight. And this is how you attach your glazing right here to the T. And then you have your carrier frame, you have other steel elements connected to them. But basically we have a tempered glass pane on the outside heat soak tested and low iron and all of those properties that you need, especially to avoid uh, the spontaneous breakage that glass can go through. Um, then you have your argon cavity here. So you have a cavity in between and then you have a laminated um, glass stain on the inside. And this is what the mock-up looks like. So they did it much earlier on to see if they like the effect, but especially to study the effect of lighting on this um, woven panel motif to see if that was what they wanted and what kind of, a, of an idea that would give about the cladding and all of that. So this is what happened. They were very happy with it. We worked with the loads of these panels and uh, with the attachment to it. Obviously, those panels are randomly placed. You saw that it's based on that circulation pattern. So our design had to go by that type of demand. Um, but then at the end of the day, the attachment is very easy. It's like a Z clip that attaches onto our structure. So they can be removed for maintenance or for cleaning or anything else very easily. Um, another type of facade is at the bottom of the building. It's a storefront facade. So much more straightforward. Maybe you're also more familiar with it and you use it more frequently in your project. I just like to point out simple aspects that are, however, very important, such as the size of your modules. I spoke about, I've spoken about it today a couple of times, right? I like to point out that you have to work with realistic sizes for your glass because in some cases it gets too large and it can't be fabricated. In other cases, it just gets more expensive. So you should be aware of it and make a decision on whether or not that's the direction you want to take. So for the WTO1 facade, the one that I just showed, we kept the modules down to about six feet by 12 feet to make sure they would be fairly standard sizes and nothing too expensive would have to happen for them. And it worked out just great because the distance between the different truss modules was about six feet. So it's a clean detail. You don't really see any joints or anything. For this one, just as easy. Less than six feet in one direction, about 10 feet in the vertical direction. So it's a fairly standard size again. And it's a very easy detail. It's a glazed facade with vertical butt joints, so minimal invasion in terms of where the pieces of glass are joined together. You get maximum transparency, and this is your way of welcoming people from the street to look into what the new building looks like, right? Um, glass build-up, just to give you another frame of reference. Again, heat strength and laminated glass pane on the outside, your cavity, your tempered glass pane. Um, no iron, and then solar control applied, um, always on phase two. We have some critting here to hide what happens at the very edges, right here. So you see some critting pattern over there. And then about an inch in terms of the, um, of the seal there. Um, the detail at the bottom, quickly just to show, it's really clamped, basically. It's an IGU, isolated, um, insulated glass um, unit, and it's clamped at the bottom. And the, the main aspect of it is anything that could be a, a countersunk bolt that could be less invasive is used in this project because most of the, um, of the engineering becomes part of the architecture. So the architect was very clear on trying to conceal and minimize the visual aspects on those things. Um, other than that, it's a fairly standard detail that we work with because this is just a storefront. 
Um, other types on the sides, uh, there are some aluminum rain screen panels as well as a piece of unitized curtain wall. So all levels of complexity, some very, very unusual systems and some very standard systems. They try to really optimize um, in terms of cost because this is a public project. So it's important to, to be within a budget and live within that budget, otherwise the design cannot move forward. Um, so this is what the panel looks like, the aluminum panel. This is the texture and the color that they chose for it. It's New York City, we're very much about our like browns and reds and uh, kind of lived in types of metals. So they went by that exact um, rule. And then um, it's anodized uh, aluminum basically. And the system is very easy, it's basically a uh, on a quick contact system, so very easy to install, very easy to remove if there ever is a need for maintenance or substitution or anything like that. Um, size of the panels, very narrow, 3 feet by 11 feet. So again, very easy, manageable, easy to produce and to transport, so that was also important to us. Um, another type of facade um, is the interesting kind of skylight looking portion here at the top of the atrium. Remember, they have a very tall atrium space and uh, we have this, um, basically this, this bridge element between the two buildings. So there's a curtain wall at the very top of it and then another curtain wall system over here. Now I'll show you why I was saying that. The, the aluminum panel we just saw is here. Perpendicular to it is a glazed portion of the facade. Um, as you see here, it's 6 feet by 11 feet, so again, within reasonable sizes for the glass. Um, and there is a movement joint, this is what I wanted to point out, between this metal panel and the glass to make sure you can absorb the movements between the two portions of your, of your building, right? So you want to make sure you build in some redundancy for movement because otherwise your glass will get smashed up against your um, rest of the structure, right? Uh, one interesting aspect is the top of that little bridge atrium area here is fully glazed and it actually hosts tracks for maintenance and cleaning of the facade, permanent tracks over there. So it's actually fairly um, strong in terms of the structure and it's made out of basically moment frames here. These are very rigid um, pieces of structure, they're rigidly connected here. Um, the interesting thing is on this side is the new building. On this side is the roof of the existing one. When you see this curve, this curve is where the new facade sits on the roof of the existing building. One thing you don't want to do when you work with something existing and you put something new on is share lateral loads with something that has been there a while because you don't know what the structure is taking, what it's designed for, and what was actually built to do. And you don't want to take risks in having shared lateral loads, wind or seismic or whatever that might be. So what you do is you try to build a separation between the two buildings. You can always assess a vertical load capacity for buildings, so you can put a little extra load on a roof. What you don't want to do is give it ways to share wind or seismic forces. Because if there ever is a failure, you won't really be able to understand what happened there. And so what we did was, we didn't have a choice, we had to land this on the, on the existing roof. So what we did was, we gave it a connection that rules for lateral loads, so it never really absorbs any lateral loads. They all go back into the new building, so back here, but it takes vertical loads. So we share the vertical weight of this, half on the existing and half on the new building. So that was our solution for that. Uh, the structural engineer, which was not us, was very worried about this happening, and so we came up with this detail. They did not want to study what the existing building was good for. So we, we decided to avoid the crisis and just go with this detail. Um, another type of curtain wall, vertical glazing. The interesting thing about it is that there are portions that are perfectly vertical. We know how they work. And there are portions that are slightly angled, just like one that we were seeing in the studio before. So um, this was done for, um, daylight penetration reasons, much like what you guys were trying to do there. So the interesting thing about it is that um, basically it's an IGU again, it's an um, insulated glass unit. Uh, it's an inside-outside condition, but, I'm sorry, it's an inside-inside condition, meaning it separates a classroom from an atrium. So it's not a proper facade, it's more of an interior 
um, glazed unit basically. Um, the interesting part is the angle and the fact that we tried to minimize the basically the cost of this, which was an interior facade, by keeping the module very efficient, like 5 by 12 or something like that, and making very um, standard, if you will, aluminum spandrel panels to go with it. So the glazing buildup is fairly standard, similar to the ones that we've seen before. Um, and then the aluminum spandrel panels just cover basically where the slab gets the facade, so that you get a concealed look when you are in the edge and looking up. You don't see the full structure, you see this beautifully glazed um, kind of transparent partition there. So you see the structure here, all hidden completely behind by the aluminum panel. Um, the last step, I believe, is the, the fun one from the existing building, basically. So one thing that happens if you have an existing building and you build up against it is the glass in that facade has to be fire-rated glass. And so we have to substitute all of the windows of the Feldman building to be fire-rated windows, to our fire-rated. So we went back to this and they said, you can clean all of these panels, put them back up, but for the windows you need a two-hour fire rating. Because now if there's a fire developing in this building, it's going to affect the existing building, you can't do that. And so the fire protection came as a requirement, so we um, are showing two hour fire rated glass at all of these openings. We are taking out all of these uh, aluminum panels, we're cleaning them, restoring them, and putting them back on, so that the interface is still the authentic one from the building. Um, something about two-hour fire rating glass, I don't know how many of you have actually studied it, looked into it, seen uh, what it's like. It's a very unusual type product, let's call it that way. It's very expensive, it's very thick. It's basically a very thick piece of glass that when fire comes, there's a special substance that foams up when the fire hits it so that it protects the, um, basically the environment behind it. But it's extremely thick and very, very heavy because it's extremely dense material. So in terms of structural um, toll that it takes on, on, uh, on any building, it's a massive type of undertaking. So when we did it for our luxury residential that I showed before, it has a whole host of consequences. In this case, it was really more about the cost and the fact that only a couple of companies in the world produce two-hour fire-rated glass. And they don't really make it in any fancy shape or anything because it's too um, too complicated to give two hour fire rating um, certification. So it's mostly, it's flat, basically, it doesn't come curved, and it comes in smaller, um, basically, areas. So you can shape it in different ways, but there's only a certain amount of square feet that you can make in one module before you need to close it out with framing and start the next module. So this was part of the research that we did to find out how to solve that problem. So this is currently in bid phase, which means in a few weeks we should be done, a bidder will be selected and we will finally start, and three years from now it should be completely built. That's it. Thank you. Six weeks to be done. 
and this that only in design was probably two and a half years or something. So the balance varies, but I would say um, it really is um, a lot more about. Um, I think it's about the the way we approach problems. For us, even this large large project, just like the FIT project, is about the details. So a lot of our time is spent on detailing no matter what, because the architect will want to see how we actually plan on doing that. That sounds crazy. And so normally it ends up down to the details uh, for most of them right away. Thank you. Other questions? Otherwise, I have a question. Is there at the FIT building, was there anything you couldn't do what the architect wanted? The architect wanted. Um, so this project has a long history. I'll just go by and say it started in 2008. Then the recession hit, they stopped it. We weren't the designer back then, but they picked it back up in 2013 or 14, and then we were brought on board. Um, the very first concept they had was very different. It just fell through for them, so it had nothing to do with, with us. But I think in terms of what they want now, we got, we did everything that they wanted. The problem is it's a public project, so it went through um, an evaluation of costs that is very, very rigorous several times because the DASNI, which is the dormitory authority, goes through all of that with all of their projects and they have evaluations of budget and cost and everything. So there were a couple of value engineering processes that it went through. Something got scaled down, but they fought very hard for that facade to remain almost the same that it was in the beginning. We just helped them optimize the sizing so you see that those teeth are actually just two pieces of metal welded to each other that do the trick. So we made them as small as possible, but wide enough to host the glass. And we made the process so easy that it's actually rather inexpensive to do. And the system can be installed in several different ways. So yeah, we, we probably managed to do 99% of what they wanted, I would say, yeah. Anybody else? Can you speak on how you strike a balance between, this, I guess, cost? You talk a lot of time about the panel sizing and mm -hmm. things, and then also the larger architectural gestures, and how those kind of find a harmony balance. So I think, in general, most of the reasons why we get hired on any size project and any type project is because they're thinking, you either can't do it, or it's too expensive to do, and the client is not going to want to pay for it. And so they ask us to come on board. Usually we do a lot of brainstorming sessions with the architects and we suggest solutions and we show precedents and we show reference projects to give them an idea. And when we know what they're going for, we also tell them it's real, it's been done. We can go by this example, things that we have done, things that we know of. And uh, from there, we just start going into the research of how to make it realistically, in some cases how to make it in the United States because lots of presidents are from Europe of very innovative maybe technologies and things and we want to be real and say okay the project is in New York City for example, do you have manufacturers and suppliers that can do it or is it going to cost too much because it has to be made in Europe and shipped over. So we like to get very real on that and in many cases what we do is we go back to all of our network of suppliers and manufacturers and we do this very extensive research very early on in the project to make sure we have sources that we can rely on that can provide what we have in mind. And so in many cases it comes down to things that they suggest because they're making it and they're pricing it. So we get that type of know-how transferred and then we use it the next time and the next time. And in general it's because we've learned from doing things so many different ways. We know what works better. We know what's ultimately more cost efficient as well as better performing. In some cases it's not really about cost efficiency, but it's about performance. And so we go um, we go to the client and we explain the reasons. And so our balance is usually based on the best we can provide as cost efficiency, but also what is the performance level that we're targeting. Like that's most important to us, right? It makes a difference. And, uh, and so the, the, the good thing about it is that we have a very realistic on the market that the project is being built in. We do lots of that research um, to make sure, because you can fabricate huge pieces of glass in China, 
but maybe not here, maybe not in Doha, Qatar. And so you have to make sure you're suggesting something that is ultimately doable all the way to the end. Yes. Um, today, with environment shifts and, and so, many, so many changes, it's like there was a time you could, and Tom, you could help me here, but there's a time you could build a high rise in Chicago, and over a period of maybe 50 years, you'd have a sense of the risk, wind directions, the loads, the weather, et cetera, right? But nowadays, we're having heat in places that may have heat. We're having snow in places that aren't used to snow. We're having wind shears as a result of all of this, hurricane forces that so we haven't anticipated. Um, you did your thesis research on seismic factors. Does that notion of the seismic or, or the ability to accommodate change and shift, which I thought was really interesting when we were talking about the lateral loads and the way the buildings sit together, yes. and you were saying we can handle the little point loads if we can calculate that, but do not ask it ever to share lateral movement. So in today's world, as you guys go on and do these projects all over the world, the same way if you were in a seismic region, you would think about that. Are you now thinking about factors in your engineering that account for multiple possibilities that you never accounted for before? Or is that not happening yet? Is that still another 20 or 30 years out before engineers are going to start going, I have no idea what the wind in Chicago will be for the next 100 years or whatever. Is that beginning to impact the world of Engineering, high level engineering. I think it, in some ways it is. In New York City in particular, after Sandy and all of the damage that happened in 2012, mm -hmm. it, it, was, it took a huge toll on the city, on yeah. lots of structures, lots of facades, obviously, and, and everything around it, right? So from there, I think people built a renewed uh, awareness of what can happen mm -hmm. and should we really think that it only happens once every 200 years, or is it actually yeah. more like one every, once every five or six years? Because unfortunately, it's what it looks like, right? right? So I think a lot of the design is almost subconsciously building in an additional safety All factor. Or exactly, especially for wind loads. Right. Because at the end of the day, hurricanes and those strong winds and, and all of these things are more and more common, as you were saying. And it's not realistic to think that you're going to have to replace your facade panes every five years just because the wind was too strong. Yes, it's possible. And in some cases, we tell the client the way that it is. We tell them, this is your scenario per code, exactly per code, and this is what we suggest. Um, because obviously, there is a premium you have to pay. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it becomes more and more of a realistic factor. And so in some cases, the clients have no problem saying yes. I would like to build a little redundancy in this. So what you're also saying is for those who might be interested in policy, you know, we also have a department of planning, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of these things happen at the level of code, policy, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. right? So I'm speaking to you, imagining that the engineer can go ahead and anticipate it, but what you're actually saying to me is it has to happen on all kinds of fronts. It's that it's, it's a much bigger picture, yes, because right. we as engineers get the code and we get all the values and the wind speed and all of the factors and then right. we put them together and there are your loads and there's your money and size. But right. in reality, it comes from studies that have been done and that thankfully are updated every few years, so they're a little bit closer to reality. But definitely, we're building in an extra factor. One thing I noticed already earlier on when I joined and I started working on this facade at IT was that we were using 50 year return period to check deflections of the facade, right. which is something you don't do. 50 year return period is for the strength of the facade. So for deflections, you just use 10 years. Like that's how you measure it. And I thought it's a smart move because you want this glass to really perform well under even severe conditions. Right. And so that's one example in which you don't follow the book. Okay. You do what the practice does because it would be too skimpy to just follow the book and then say this was stronger than 98 miles an hour, hence it failed. If that's not what you want, right. you want a little redundancy there, especially on projects such as this one that are public, that are large, they are Slacking. expensive and very impactful. I, I think the point is somehow, you know, we have the idea that you design it once and for all, but there's never once and for all, right? You're constantly having to, in your design, you're thinking about the future multiple ways. Yes. Right? Not just the life cycle, etc. Yeah. Just curious about that because it seems like you know, every 
some people turn around and going, oh my god, it used to never snow here, or oh my god, it's just, you know, I can't believe it's so hot in, right? And so I'm just curious. But of course, it's true. If I thought it through, I would have known it starts with code. Right. Yeah. And even just the idea of the temperature differential that you use to size your steel, for example, the inside outside position, all of that, the range gets wider and wider because we want to account for the fact that temperatures are so random nowadays. We just exactly. don't know what right. it's going to be like. And so right. you build in a little fluff factor in right. there by widening that range a little, just making sure you're covering a little more of your um, weather conditions. Well, it seems that the future thinking is in everybody's minds, or seems to be, it since that one building stood up in Mexico Beach after Hart and Michael and everything else was planned. I don't know if you've seen that photo. Yes. Right? And that was built in concrete for the winds which actually hit the coast, which nobody had thought would hit that coast. Right. It's very much real. We take one last question. Or please thank Enrico for the great. Thank you.